You know, the choir just sang about Jesus. I'd really rather preach a whole message on nothing but Jesus. I really would. But we're in condition in our world today. I've got to preach what the Lord has given me for this morning. And uh, we're just at that time. And our world is not as wonderful as we'd like to see it. Unless you've been living under a rock or just arrived from another planet, I know you're aware that our world is in great turmoil. And our nation is severely divided, to say the least. Don't have to tell you about a war that's going on between Russia and Ukraine. North Korea just sent 30,000 troops to Russia to help them try to defeat little Ukraine. We're supplying money, armaments, weapons to Ukraine to help try to defeat the Russians. We, as Americans, are involved in that war. We like it or not, we really are. And that's not the only big war that's going on. It, it, another going on between Israel and Iran, and, and we're involved in that one too. If you know anything about what's taking place this last year between Israel and Iran, you know that there's been a constant bombardment of rocket fire from Hezbollah and also out of Gaza, uh, from Lebanon and Syria into Israel, just almost nonstop. But Iran made a huge attack in April. Hundreds of rockets were fired. Only one fatality. God put his hand down and protected his people. Again, the 1st of October, again, Iran fired missile after missile after missile. No fatalities. God protected them. After 180 ballistic missiles aimed at Israel, either went over it or hit someplace where it didn't do much damage. And this is a very high-tech, sophisticated country that was firing at them. They, these were not small, powerless weapons they were using. They were huge. Israel finally decided they'd retaliate on October the 26th, and they did. They sent over 100 warplanes and hit 20 strategic military targets. They didn't want to hit the general population. They didn't want to hit the oil, which is the source of the income for the country. And they didn't want to take out their nuclear sites. They just wanted to let Iran know, we can do it. They took out all of their uh, sites, the uh, radar sites, so that they couldn't see them coming. And then they came, and they began to take one base after another, missile factories, silos, on it went. They let Iran know they were in business. And of course, Iran is saying that you're going to have to pay for this. I heard an Israeli general say to right after that, he said, if Iran should retaliate, we are prepared and ready to respond tomorrow with more severity than the Iranians can imagine, one threatening the other. That's the world we're in right now. And yes, those things happen. That's going to affect us. It already is affecting us. Some of the prices we're paying in the grocery store due to what we're spending on military weaponry for other countries. I'm not saying we're wrong, I'm just saying it's a fact. And that's the world we're living in. And our notion right now, as you know, we're focused on an election that's going to take place day after tomorrow. Two very different candidates from two very different uh, political parties. But the outcome of this election is not only going to affect us, it's going to affect our children and our grandchildren. We need to pay attention. We need not to ignore it and say, oh, well, they're just going to do what they're going to do. And I've heard so many people say that. That's not the case. The news media tells us it's divided 50-50 right now according to the polls. Well, it's easy to make a poll. <laughs> I mean, it really is. Go out and select your group of people and select the right group and ask them the right questions. You'll get the answers you want to hear. So I don't believe in all the polls. The poll that counts is going to be the one that takes place on Tuesday. That's the real poll. Millions of people have already voted. They're very concerned, more so than ever before. Maybe some of you are like I am. I've already voted. How many of you have already voted? Oh, my goodness. I'm preaching to the choir. Thank God for you voting. Thank you for doing that. Hope you voted right. If you prayed about it, I'm sure you did. But I want to say don't vote. 
If you've not already voted, don't vote until you've prayed and asked God to guide you. Then obey God and vote. And I'm not just talking about the presidential election. I'm talking about all of the others that are coming up, all the vacancies that need to be filled. It's so very important that we have the right kind of people in our government. As you know, we've got three branches of government, the executive branch with the president, vice president, and then we've got the Congress, legislative branch that makes the laws, the ones that actually spend the money that the president talks about giving away or spending. Make sure we vote right so we have to do that. We have to pray. Seek God's will. It's our duty and our privilege. And when we vote, we are being salt and light. We're not still in the shaker. We're getting out of the shaker with the salt. And we're letting it be known. We're a Christian. We're taking a stand. And this is how we believe things ought to be. We have a privilege to live in a country that we can do that. Now you probably don't like everything about all the candidates. I, I don't either. And there's probably some things in the uh, different political parties you don't care for either. But the question is, what really matters about a candidate that's running, does their voting record agree with the Bible? That's important. That's extremely important because if it agrees with the Bible, they're agreeing with God. If it disagrees with the Bible, they're disagreeing with God and we are in trouble electing that kind of people. Extremely important. Are they Christians? Some claim they are and some don't claim anything. Then we can't always tell. But it's a big question. Lord, you're the only one who knows if they're a Christian or not. Help me to vote for a Christian if I have that choice. And sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's not between a Christian and non-Christian because sometimes neither one is. But do they have biblical values? We gave you a verse of Scripture to look up a moment ago. Can you find it there? Proverbs 14, 34, it says, Righteousness exalteth a nation. It lifts it up. It makes it great and wonderful. But sin, that's the opposite of righteousness. It's a reproach to any people. It means that those people will be pitied in history. That means that they're going to have a downfall, a reproach to people who are led by sin. So we wonder about these people that are running for office. Are they going to lead America into being a righteous nation or not? Let the Bible guide you in your choice and vote. Where does this candidate stand on abortion? There's a Bible answer. What's right or wrong in the question of abortion? Where does the candidate stand? Murdering unborn babies? Proverbs 7, 17 says, God hates the hands that shed innocent blood. Amen. And listen to me, if you are the one that's the doctor or the nurse that's actually killing that unborn baby, or if you're the one who voted to make it legal, or if you're the one who did not vote to stop it, the blood's on our hands too. God hates the hands that shed innocent blood. That's exactly what he said. We need to be very careful about voting for someone who is willing to kill unborn babies and saying abortion is a woman's right. We've got to protect her health. Nonsense, you're not protecting the health of the baby. I'm sorry, I'm just going to give you my opinion. I don't know how you're going to do with that. But Where do the candidates stand on homosexuality? Leviticus chapter 18, 22. God says very plainly, man shall not lie with mankind as with womankind. So it's an abomination. Where does the candidates stand on that issue? Do they say, well, it's okay. That's what we're all doing there. That's how our country is. They can do what they want to do, and it's okay. And we can get them all married. We can do this, that, and it. Wait a minute. God didn't say that. And where does the candidate stand on the defense of Israel? That's an important issue. Amen. Why? Why? Because it's what God said to Abram in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. He said, I'll bless those that bless you and I will curse those that curse you. Which category do we fall in in America today? Which category are we going to fall into next year? Be careful how we vote. Choose the candidate that is going to stand with Israel. That's what God would have us to do if we want to be blessed as a nation. Oh, the list could go on and on. But we need to let the Bible guide you in your choice and then vote accordingly.
See, God's already determined some of these things, and He's already told us what's right and wrong in His eyes. And, and the candidates are facing these issues, and some of them are blatantly saying, I don't care what God says, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it the way my party says. I'm going to do it the way the public says. This group of people, they want it that way, so I'm going to make them happy. You've got to be careful with a politician. <laughs> and I've known some good politicians. I really have. They just happen to make their living that way, but you've got to be careful because they're swayed by the voice of the people. They're swayed by prestige or swayed by power and by money. Well, God's already determined who our next president is going to be. It's not going to surprise him how the vote turns out. He knows who's going to be our senators. Who knows who's going to be our congressmen. He knows that our, our, our next leaders are going to be somebody who reveal if we are going to experience God's mercy or we're going to experience God's judgment. One or the other. We're heading down that road, and it's going to be one or the other. God can only put up with what we're doing so long, and then it's going to have to be judgment if He does not extend mercy. Amen. Things are either going to get better or much, much worse. America is a wicked nation. Anybody say, no, that's not true? We as a nation have been making wicked choices. We have for a long, long time. And we've been electing wicked people for a long, long time. It's not just this election. We need to make some changes. We need to change our hearts as citizens and as voters and say, no, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to look carefully at the candidate and say, wait a minute. If you're disagreeing with my God, you're disagreeing with me and I will not vote for you. I will not choose to have you make choices that are going to control my life and the life of my children and my grandchildren. Amen. Be careful. Because we've been a wicked nation for far too many long, making wicked choices far too long and electing wicked people far too long. We're living in a sin-saturated land where evil is celebrated now. Some of the things that are being celebrated by our country today as a child, my my mama and grandma would never even say the word. Oh, no. And if I said the word, I got my mouth washed out with soap. Anybody else old enough to say that happened to you? Amen. You had some good grandmas and some good mamas. They had some good values. But look where we've come. It's a sin-saturated land where evil is now celebrated. We must and we can somehow change that. We live in a land today where the Bible is ridiculed, is it not? Biblical morality is laughed at. Christians, you're mocked, called all kinds of names, and God's existence is denied. That's the land we're living in. Go to the school and you'll find they took prayer out. You remember that? <laughs> you remember that even recently now in Louisiana they're trying to put the Ten Commandments back in the classroom. Boy, they're going to court over that one. Ten Commandments, how horrible. We don't want to indoctrinate our children with God's Ten Commandments. That's religion. The world we're living in, folks, we've got to be careful who we vote for. And we've got to let them pay attention to us when they start making decisions along these lines about our children and our schools. If we don't, the enemy will, back through history, and you're going to find no nation more wicked than we are. Some of those nations in the past saw the judgment of God on the horizon. They saw it coming. They, they knew that they were not obeying God. They knew they were disobeying God, that He was holy and righteous, and they were not, and they could see the judgment of God coming on the horizon towards them. And some of them, repented. And when they repented, God withdrew His fist of judgment and He extended His hand of mercy. Amen. You can see it again and again in the Old Testament, particularly regarding the nation of Israel. But then there were other nations who saw the same thing. They knew they were doing wrong. They saw the judgment of God coming over the horizon. They didn't care. They didn't repent. They ignored it. They ignored God's message and His messengers, and they suffered the fullness of God's wrath as they continued on their road of depravity to destruction, the same road we're on. 
mighty emperor powers fell. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Persians, the Medes, the Romans, mighty empires. They could have repented when God sent the messages, but they didn't. Try to find those empires today. You'll only find them in a history book. They don't exist. Some of the countries are there, but the empires are gone. We're heading in the same direction. Tuesday's election may determine whether we will experience God's mercy or His wrath. Were we going to continue down the road of depravity to destruction that we're on right now, or are we, as a nation, will we repent? He said, well, I don't know, brother. I don't think it's so bad. Why we got, in that case, why do we have so many empty seats? Why do you find empty seats in all the churches where the Bible is being taught and preached and people are called to get right with God? Because the public doesn't care. They don't care. They want to do things their way. They like what's fun. They like what pleases the flesh and pleases somebody else. Oh, we're on that road of depravity to destruction. Our votes may turn this ship around. There is a slim possibility that that can happen. So pray. Oh, pray and vote and pray some more. I plead with you to pray. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, a very familiar passage to many of you. It's preached many times. It's preached for revivals. It's preached for all kinds of things. But I want you to look at it closely with today and tomorrow and Tuesday in mind. God says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God says, I do want to forgive it. I do want to heal their land. I, I want to bless them instead of give them my terrible destruction. But here's what they must do. They've got to humble themselves. They're so proud. They don't think they need me. They're so proud. They think they're doing everything great. If they'll humble themselves and pray and they'll seek my face, is America seeking God today? Not for the most part. Turn from their wicked ways. You've got to acknowledge a wicked way in order to turn away from it. You've got to say, God, you're right, we're wrong. We've got to quit doing this. We've got to start doing that. Turn from our wicked ways and turn towards you. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven. Basically, what he's saying is, if you don't do that, you can call out, oh, God, help us, oh, God, help us, oh, God, help us all you want to. But you've got to be willing to repent. He says, that's what I'm going to hear, and I'm going to forgive, and I'm going to heal. I believe God has given America the warning, this warning right here, the one you're looking at. I think He's given America that warning. I, don't, I wonder how many churches across America right now today are getting the same message you're getting. I hope thousands, thousands and thousands. We need to know that God has set some guidelines, some must-dos, if He is going to forgive our sins and heal our land. We have a very narrow window of opportunity. And that window may slam shut after Tuesday's election, I don't know. It's a window through which God's forgiveness can flow and His mercy can flow and His healing may flow through that window. But it's such a narrow window of opportunity. We cannot say, well, it doesn't matter. Maybe next time we'll do better. There may not be a next time. We have enough enemies that say we're ready to blow America off the map. We've got enemies that have nuclear weapons saying we can do it. North Korea, wasn't it? They just fired their longest range missile they've ever fired, the biggest one that's ever been fired anywhere. Who do you think they're aiming at it next time they shoot it? Not at South Korea. No. We may never get another chance. There may never be another election. I don't know. And I'm not trying to frighten anybody except to do my best to share with you what I believe is the truth from God's Word today. Tomorrow night, 
and we're going to have an opportunity to pray. And again, all over the land, this, this is, word's been going out. It's on the Internet everywhere. Thank God for the Internet for this one. There's a lot on the Internet I don't thank God for, but I do for this. Please, at 6 o'clock, pray. Join with people all over this land praying for our country. If you can come here and pray, wonderful. The doors will be open and we're not going to do anything. We're not going to take up an offering. We're not going to preach. We're just going to come and pray. And no, we're not even going to serve food. <laughs> we're just going to pray. And you say, well, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. I'm just on a job all day long. Stay at home and pray. God will hear you no matter where you are. So pray. Fall on our faces and confess our nation's sins. Be honest before God and repent and pray for mercy. Every prayer matters. Every vote matters. Your prayer is important, just like your vote is important. Many of election has been won or lost by a single vote. Do you remember what happened in Sodom? Do you remember the story about Sodom and how God said, Abram, Ham, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. God said, Abraham said, oh, don't do that. Lot, lots down there. My family's down there. Don't do that. And God said, no, no, I'm going to destroy it. He said, how about if you find 50 righteous people there? Would you not destroy it for 50 righteous people in the whole city? And God said, all right, for 50 righteous people, if I can find 50 in the city, I won't destroy it. And God said, oh, look, there's not 50. How about 40? Okay. How about 30? No, there's not there. What about 20? How about 10? If there had been 10 righteous people in that city, that city would not have been destroyed. I'm telling you, your vote is important. The stand that you take is important. Your righteousness is important. It's important to those that live around you, important to your family, important to your nation. Let me shift gears for just one moment. Shift away from our nation to ourselves. It's more important than your vote. It's even more important than the outcome of the election and who's going to be in the White House. More important than that is back in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Can you all pull that up again? He said, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, my people. The big question is, are you one of those? Amen. Are you one of God's people? Yes. Oh, this is Old Testament. At that time, he was speaking to the Jewish people, his chosen people. But today, it covers all of the born-again believers. Those who've trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior and been adopted into God's family. They've been born again. Those are his people. Amen. The question is, are you one of those? If so, this ought to speak to you. If the answer is yes, your sins have already been forgiven. Your personal sins, oh, the nation may go down in flames, but your sins have been forgiven because you've been saved by the Lord Jesus and His blood. And you've receiving God's mercy, not His wrath. But if the answer is no, I'm, I'm not one of those. Or if you're not sure, what do you need to do? Humble yourself and pray. <laughs> Humble yourself and pray and seek God's face and turn from your wicked ways. He said, well, how do I know if I found God's face? Look to Jesus. That's God in the flesh. You seek God and you seek Jesus, you will find God. No, that's what you do. Turn from your wicked ways and repent and trust the Lord Jesus. Again, there's a very narrow window of opportunity for you. I don't know how long that window of opportunity is going to be open for you if you've never been saved. I can't tell you. I have no idea. You don't know either. You may say, well, I'm young. I'm going to live a long, long time. I can go out and sow my wild oats, do what I want to do, get wild and crazy. And then when I get old and can't do anything else, then, then I'll get saved. Oh, really? How old are you going to be? How many more heartbeats do you have? Only God has the answer to that. The window of opportunity is only that much you've got now. 
now. That's all you've got. You're not, you're not even guaranteed an hour from now. You've got now. That's the window of opportunity. And listen to me, my friend. If you've not already saved, you need to be saved now. Not tomorrow, not next week. Now. You need to today acknowledge the reality of your sin that is separating you from God and will keep you out of heaven. You need to humble yourself just like God said in that verse. Humble yourself and say, I can't save myself. I'm not going to be good enough. And realize the truth that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sin so God can forgive you. <coughs> Confess that you need Him. Trust Him. He's the only one who can save you. And then you pray. Dear Jesus, please save me. It's not hard. It can be done, and it can be done here and now. If you never have, we want to give you that opportunity at this very moment. I'd like to pray. Maybe you can pray right along with me. If you've never prayed and trusted Jesus, here is your chance. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you've given us warning about all kinds of things. You gave us a warning as a nation. But Father, you've also, more importantly, given us a warning as individuals that without Jesus, we'll never see heaven. And Father, if there's anybody here right now that would say, I don't have Jesus in my heart and in my life. I, I, I've never asked him to come in and save me. I want to, but I never have. Father, if there's one person thinking thoughts like that, invite them to come to you. Let them know they can do it right now. That you will hear them as they pray. When they say, dear God, forgive me. I am a sinner. Dear God, forgive me. Let them know you'll hear them. When you pray, they pray, Dear Jesus, come into my heart and save me. I want to be one of God's people. I need to be forgiven. I need to be saved. And Jesus, you're the only one that can do it. I'm asking you to. I'm not trusting anything else, just you. Thank you.